Live from Toronto, Canada, it's theCUBE. Covering Global Cloud and Blockchain Summit 2018. Brought to you by theCUBE. Hello everyone, welcome back. This is theCUBE's coverage in Toronto for the Global Cloud and Blockchain Summit, part of the big event also happening for two days, Wednesday and Thursday, the Blockchain Futurist Conference here in, in Canada. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. Our next guest is the founder and CEO of DigitalBits.io, as well as FuseChain, and a serial entrepreneur, and also the mastermind behind this inaugural event, first time a cloud blockchain conference has come together, bringing the two communities together. Al, great to see you, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me, thank you for coming to Toronto, Canada. It's our, our pleasure, yeah. certainly as you know, we love cloud, we cover all the cl big cloud shows, we're dominating that market in terms of coverage and, and, and access, and we just started covering blockchain in 2018 with theCUBE, although on Silicon Angle since 2011 with the, with the written word and journalism. But this is interesting, you are uh, the brainchild behind this event, and I want you to explain why you came up with this event idea, because this is the first time that you got two worlds coming together. You're bringing the cloud DNA, and that could go back to like classic networking, and think of big hosting providers, the Exodus and the Equinox of the world, the, the yeah. big pumps who, who built, these guys are the same guys who built YouTube's back end, and Facebook, large scale network guys, with this new emerging blockchain world, because there's some connection points and it's super important and no one's ever done that before. What's the motivation behind a cloud and blockchain summit? Well, I mean, if you think of the internet, um, all of that data, all of that traffic, uh, substantial majority of it is flowing through data centers, uh, infrastructure providers globally. Um, and within many of those data centers you have cloud providers, whether it's you know, cloud computing, um, SaaS, software as a service uh, 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 cloud providers, uh, you name it. Um, and now we have upon us this emerging technology, uh, blockchain technology. Uh, many are referring to it as uh, Web 3.0. Um, and I'm a, obviously a big believer in that this is the next evolution of the internet. We had internet 1.0 in the 90s. We had um, um, you know, Web 2.0 with social, the sharing economy and so forth. And, and all, you know, along the way each each step you had are your first movers, your willing followers, and, and then the unwilling followed. Um, it was, it's been that powerful, uh, the last two occurrences that we saw with the evolution of the internet. Web 3.0 is, is that next thing. Uh, first movers, willing followers, the unwilling. Um, every time you have this, um, something very innovative, um, obviously there's a big engineering, or initially starts amongst you know, um, uh, community of engineers, and, and then it starts to go mainstream. Um, um, obviously a lot happens in between um, conception and, and it going mm -hmm. mainstream. Um, and if we look at um, the 90s, you know, uh, Linux played a substantial role in the acceleration um, uh, of innovation. It really extracted, you know, uh, it took a different approach to software, you know, really leading open source. And, it um, took down some <coughs> proprietary incumbents, Unix. A absolutely, absolutely. And um, free and open source software, but it still needed to be supported. Um, which, which version of Linux sh should enterprises embrace? And at that time, um, it was very important um, with what we saw emerge with you know, things like Intel, IBM, Dell, HP, and so forth, getting behind um, organizations like Red Hat and their version of, uh, of Linux, you know, now known as Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Now, IBM put a billion <coughs> dollars into it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so, Mills, yeah. so with regard to that, you know, it was it was all about the hardware validating, right? These trusted vendors to the enterprise, um, and um, and them kind of validating a company like uh, or endorsing a company in effect like Red Hat um, really helped provide a guiding light to the enterprise. Um, <clears throat> now it's not about hardware; it's about the cloud. Right, cloud computing providers and so forth. And it's, you know, in that ecosystem, it's not just AWS, it's not just Microsoft. There are many um, data center providers that uh, have built a cloud computing offering that are supporting substantial financial institutions, substantial organizations within healthcare space insurance, and many, many other industries. So they play a very important role in supporting an enterprise with their implementation, integration, and consumption of technologies, including new and emerging technologies. And so, um, 
as we have sort of before us this emergence of, of blockchain, what I was founding, obviously having a, uh, lived in, in, in the cloud uh, and infrastructure community for a number of years, with, with the last company I had founded, um, know a lot of the key stakeholders. And uh, even though I'm all in on blockchain, you know, I pop in every now and then in, 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 in that world. And what I found was two different extremes. You had CTOs and even CEOs of, of cloud computing organizations um, and others within those organizations, totally you know, high get it factor. And you had the other extreme, multi-billion dollar cloud computing organizations, you know, data center organizations, where, again, the leadership team was still trying to figure it out, really, in some respects, not fully paying attention yet. And I saw that uh, this is definitely emerging. You know, you're, again, you'll have first movers, willing followers, and the unwilling. They're all going to get there, but it hadn't gone there yet. And, and so, with regards to this event, I saw a, a huge opportunity to really put something out there um, allow it to ultimately take a life of its own, and, and there's new, uh, a new organizer that's going to be coming forward and, and, and driving the ship with this event. Um, but ultimately, there needed to be a forum, uh, not just here in North America, um, but in every corner of the world, uh, the Global Cloud and Blockchain Summit, providing this opportunity for that convergence, uh, and for both communities to really share knowledge and accelerate, fill that, that gap. And uh, I saw it, it's there, it is there, um, there's amazing uh, uh, things being spoken of on stage as we sort of are sitting here um, with leading innovators um, and so forth from, from both sides. There was an amazing keynote today by you know, Anthony Diorio, um, one of the co-founders of Ethereum and, and you know, founder and CEO of, of De Decentral and Jax, um, you know, really um, um, you know, helping support uh, the event today and, and making a contribution, was, his talk was phenomenal. So that's, that, awesome. that's kind of the you know, thought behind it, and, and, it's, you know, and here we are. I want to pick up on something you said <clears throat> for our audience. You know, I mean, for guys like you, Al, that are deep into it, you, you understand this very well, but you talked about Linux and how essentially the web was built on, on Linux. So if you were a Linux developer back in the day and you wanted to invest in Linux, you didn't have a vehicle to do that. You could put your time in. Yeah. You know, you could maybe maybe join a company and maybe get some stock, but there was no way to directly invest in Linux. Yeah. Well, today there is. With blockchain and crypto economics, you actually can, whether it's tokenize your business or participate, you can buy tokens, and so it's it's a whole different incentive structure. And you know, many in our audience are sort of new to this, kind of un un the unwilling, <laughs> if yeah. you will. And, that's a, a, an amazing new way to create capital structures. Very, very, and very powerful. I mean, the, you know, uh, prior to this, this tokenized uh, uh, revolution that we're seeing here, it was a cool open source project as an entrepreneur, or sorry, engineer, you wanted to kind of be a part of this, contribute your time, and, uh, and quite often you would ask your employer to you know, permit you to have 10%, 20% of your time to commit to these projects, or maybe you would even ask for that in your job interview. Um, and you'd maybe get the thumbs up, you know? And so, uh, your employer's in effect subsidizing your time to really um, contribute to projects and code that you're very passionate about. But if they got busy, you know, economic cycles and what have you, and it's like, you know what, we need you to 100% uh, focus on your day job, all of a sudden that community, that open source community is losing perhaps a very valuable contributor, right? And these, there was really no way for that direct incentive from that project, and that's really what this is now. Um, projects can be created. We think of, you know, some blockchains like an operating system. You now have, an, you know, to use the Linux comparison. Now, let's say a operating system can have its own incentive or um, a reward or uh, compensation uh, structure to really help attract uh, engineers mm -hmm. and other valuable contributors to not just give birth to a project but help make it sustainable. Yeah. And you know, eventually, maybe you're quitting the day job and, and uh, because it's, you know, it's, it's able to be free, open source, and um, you know, providing uh, an enlightened self-interest. I'm getting some messages here, direct messages, um, listening to you talk, I want to share them with you. One says, one guy says, hey Al, what's the deal with different blockchains? How do I tell? So I'm not an unwilling, I'm a want to believe. I'm like, uh, I'm not at the front end, but I just, what do I put, what do I pay attention to? And there's so many different chains. You got people promoting certain things. I don't know whose stats are real. You got two kids in a garage, yeah. just did an ICO. So the question is, what, essentially, 
What's the difference in all these chains? What do I have to look for? Is it latency? Who's solving these problems? What's the big deal and how do I determine better chain from another chain? Are they all going to work together? Yeah. What's your thoughts? Things are moving incredibly fast right now and, and it is difficult to keep, um, keep up the speed. Um, you know, it was, maybe it was just Bitcoin at one time and you know, one, one chain to focus on. And then there was you know, Ethereum and all these others and, and now there's many, many more. So, um, ultimately, um, it is about information, staying current with that information, doing your due diligence, but you really need to have um, uh, a community that you're a part of, uh, that, that uh, you can kind of um, share in your evaluation and monitoring of, of what's new and emerging. So community uh, is important. Very important, very important. Uh, uh, really, um, um, you know, say trusted advisors, trusted peers, um, and you kind of take a collective approach at this. Nonetheless, it's, it, we're in this you know, pioneering era. Um, mass innovation happening. Um, what's winning today you know, may not necessarily be continuing to win tomorrow, um, but you really need to um, uh, maintain a discipline and, and um, uh, take a peer approach to, to um, staying current um, uh, with it. In terms of public chain, private chain, they're all going to play a role, and they are playing a role uh, in different use cases. Uh, there's, you know, there's clearly a use case for private chain within enterprise, within, say, um, you know, a trusted circle of, of supply chain participants. Where maybe you want to, you know, bring some efficiencies to all of that. Um, but what's so use I, case drives yeah, the absolutely. chain. But public chain is a phenomenal phenomenon, yeah. and you know, it's among other things that we hear a lot about. It's given birth to the ICO, this new way of capital formation that is unbelievably awesome. The world has never seen anything like this, where... Um, Explain that. Well... Capital formation dynamic. Yeah, so, to. I mean, the traditional way, um, yeah, as we, you know, whether it's you know in Silicon Valley or any other part of the world, you, you have an entrepreneur that, you know, maybe they haven't had a big, big exit where they could fund their own, you know, next venture on their own. You know, they, they you know, um, smart, intelligent people with a brilliant idea, and they're doing that friends and family round, mm -hmm. right? Um, that are, you know, the due diligence checklist isn't that long. It's like, you know what, um, love my son, he's the smartest kid on the planet, you know, you give him a few dollars and a few other friends and family, um, you know, start to, uh, this new emerging entrepreneur. And if that gets, you know, there's evolution there, things are uh, picking up traction and so forth, then maybe you're doing an angel round. And there's this sort of structured process that history's sort of defined for us. And then from an angel round, you know, you, you have this, early stage company emerging and, and new milestones being reached and, and then maybe there's a venture, you know, a, a series A venture capital round and what have you. And then you have the, you know, the series A, the series B and so forth, right? The typical uh, approach to things. Uh, very regimented, um, you know, Silicon Valley has been a dominating force of the venture capital community in, in that form but of But the dynamics are formation. different than the venture capital. Yeah, so I, I've just sort of, that's the way that we've always sort of known, right? Uh, many, many early stage companies, the process they go through, many, many meetings behind closed doors and so forth. Cloak and dagger, yeah. black box, this how does it work? This whole concept of, of uh, crowdsourcing, is, you know, still beholden to the financial systems that are out there. Um, how do you really foster community out there and, and raise so you're saying maybe it's a few million dollars? So it's easy to raise money now? It Easier. absolutely is. I mean, you have this new meeting of exchange where um, you have cryptocurrencies like Ether, and you're, you, you know, you're basically sharing your idea with, with the world, and then all of a sudden saying, hey, you know, we, here's our token economics, we'd like to raise some capital, and then whether it's minutes, hours, or, or even weeks, you have capital coming to you from different corners of the world, and it's coming to yeah. you in seconds. Yeah. Um, highly efficient, you have this sort of universal, these universal currencies now emerging, and it's, it's, it's an amazing sensation. Yeah. And, and, and it's a new form of capital formation. And with capital formation, you have innovation. So I believe you know, we're just going to continue to see um, this, the, an acceleration of innovation globally happening, and not just in certain pockets of the world now, um, in many, many corners of the world. I mean, what's happening in Asia is absolutely phenomenal um, in, in the blockchain space as well. It's, it's not just interesting here in North America, in fact, in some respects, even more interesting, depending on how you look at it. Describe in, what's in happening in Asia. You guys talked about this last night on the fireside chat. Well, I mean, some of the um, publicly available information is that you could just simply see on many of the cryptocurrency exchanges out there, 
um, an insane amount of volume, you know, more so than any, any other corner of the world. Mm -hmm. And so you have a very active um, investor community up there, uh, trading community, um, token buyer community, and, and what have you. It's a and where are the pockets? So very uh, healthy. Uh, uh, so was China, and then, then shift, things shifted sort of to Japan. Well, um, you know, where, maybe where maybe, the maybe where the uh, centralized exchange is, is is happening, but it's I think it's still a lot of the same people. It's not like mm -hmm. it got shut down in the country and those people just lost their desire. They they just found an alternative means to continue to participate. Right. Uh, but you know, South Korea, it's, it's phenomenal. You have Hong Kong, you have Japan, you have. Uh, Singapore among among many of the pockets, but then there's, you know, it's it's everywhere. I mean, uh, you're meeting people from Vietnam, um, Thailand, India. You know, they're all the very active investor community um, and, and and utility token buyer community, um, and and it's very healthy. And it's it's um, yes, you have, you know, a, a correction every now and then in this market, uh, but you have that with any sort of new uh, exciting innovation. Um, but it continues to thrive up there. Um, it's phenomenal. Yeah, so and you're seeing one of the main uh, uses of Bitcoin to buy alternative yeah. currencies. That's a huge, sucking up huge amounts of volume. It's an easier currency to move. I mean, in a matter of seconds or minutes, you can have um, a currency go from a bedroom in Florida, um, uh, you know, here in Toronto, to a project in Singapore, or vice versa, yeah. um, you know, without going through a bank. Mm -hmm. So we're getting some more questions from the crowd. If you want to reach us, tweet, tweet us either direct message or tweet at Furrier at D Vellante. Happy to take your questions for the guests. But one says, do we buy now? <laughs> and the second was, does China, does this sidestep the tariffs of the China, Japan, US thing, obviously outside the United States, we're the world power in the United States, but now that power shifting. You see China here in Canada, a lot of crypto DNA here. So interesting, your thoughts on Buying <laughs> on the dip or crash or however you look at it, um, and then the international dynamic with China and Japan and others. So many are seeing it as a dip. I mean, the reality is, if this is a new form of capital formation, um, it doesn't have. It, it does share s um, similar characteristics, nonetheless, still to traditional early stage investment in, in venture capital in, in, in many respects. Not every startup succeeds. In fact, you know, over ninety percent traditionally don't make it. Even if they make it to a series A round, they may not make it to a B round, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, um, the fact that you have, um, you know, some people were kind of referring to the Wild Wild West, I don't necessarily see it that way, it's just finding its way, yeah. right? Um, and it's, it's going to get to a mature well, I think, state. I think people look at the bubble and they think Wild Wild West, but the interesting thing about, we, you know, we talked about this off camera last night, Around international is, and this is essentially no one really knows what this, the standards will be. This this will be a completely different landscape than anything we've seen before, whether it's standards or execution. And I hear the argument uh, all the time of, oh, it's unregulated. And certainly, the United States is taking a more regulatory approach. You know, the SEC essentially scaring straight everybody and saying, well, they're trying yeah. to figure it out. Oh, well, and they're trying to figure it out, but also they kind of slows things down in the process. Yeah. But that being said. It doesn't, it might not have to be formally regulated because you mentioned Linux. The role of self-governing communities is a very interesting dynamic. No one's actually said and said, actually and analyzed what a regulatory regime globally would look like if you factor in kind of the open source concepts. Well. With self-governance, because communities are very efficient. And we got money involved. Yeah. It could be even more efficient. That's called a marketplace. You know, the, but you know, people have disposable income and they decide what they want to do with that disposable income. You go to a restaurant, you go buy some groceries, you invest, you maybe buy some commodities, right? And where we put that money, that the, the value we have that we wish to exchange for something else, some of it goes into some regulatory worlds and some doesn't. You know, I don't, if I want to go buy you some commodities at the, at the grocery store, I mean, it's a free and open source trend, you know, free and open transaction. There's no KYC AML per se. And, but that and, food's got to ship, but that food has to get to the supermarket. My point is, yeah, marketplaces exist. It doesn't exist. require regulation. That's my say. point. You know, That's my point. Um, or additional red tape, right? But where we put other capital does. So whether you're buying a share certificate, um, early stage investing, yeah, there's, there's SEC filing. Who regulated perhaps. Linux? Regulated Linux. Yeah. I mean, it was self-governing. Well, it was, self it, it was, it was benevolent dictatorship but, with, with uh, Turbo. But the so. capital formation was different in the Linux industry. It was yeah. a more traditional path that you just described, and so that those so, were. But what I guess what I'm saying is that when you have a token, 
Um, some token could represent the, a commodity, some token could represent a security. So there needs to be that distinction yeah. and a framework of clarity um, so that we understand what needs to be regulated yeah. and, and go on that path. And so I think that's kind of part of finding its way over the past 12 months or so is, is um, yeah. this distinction. Some countries have, um, were very quick to say, hey, here's a framework, like Switzerland. Um, you know, that clarity here is taking a bit of time. In, yeah, in I, th Canada I think, and, I think the they US. should let things foster and incubate a bit because you don't know the gestation period of real technology and I think I'm cool with community-oriented governance because people will lose a, some, a boatload of cash, some will gain, but that'll all sort itself out and with good community involvement, it'll happen faster. I just find that a better path. I mean, some people can't stay with that tension. They overreact, some people can handle the risk but you got to see how it plays out at some level. You do, you definitely do. But there was all, also an opportunity for self-governance. You know, you have with, um, uh, there's the regional internet uh, uh, registries, right? So you have Aaron, uh, Ripe in Europe and so forth. You know, if you want an IP address and so forth, it's a self-governing body that defined policy and how these things are going to be disseminated here in North yeah. America. That's the government, you know, kind of stayed That's a good off model, that, right? the DNS and, system. You know, absolutely, I mean, these, this is valuable. Yeah. You know, you have national security with internet, but it's, you know, how IPs are disseminated, it's self-regulated. So, at the end of the day, if, if the community doesn't decide to say, hey, some of these things will, let's, let's define self-governing bodies, and if they could play a great role in it all, fantastic. Otherwise, you know, maybe the government steps in, if, if that's the type of country it, it is, where they like to, well, Engage. Al, everyone's reimagining new opportunities with blockchain and crypto. You certainly got a good bench with digital bits. We'll certainly have a conversation later here this week about that. Uh, congrats, I know you got to get back in for a panel um, that you're going to go on now, so thanks for coming on. And congratulations on the inaugural Global Cloud and Blockchain Summit. Uh, looking, looking forward to talking more about Thank it. You. This is theCUBE here, live in Toronto, for coverage of uh, the global blockchain event here with Cloud. And then tomorrow kicks off the big show here, the blockchain futurist, about 2,000 attendees. That's going to be really about the, connecting the dots of the future. The Cube will be there as well. Stay with us for more live coverage after this short break.